Lots of friends joining us. Uh, thank you for being here with us this evening. We truly appreciate it. You know, you've been working hard all day and here you are again, uh, joining us for this book study. So we're very grateful. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, hello and welcome to Patton's book study series, Structured Literacy Interventions, Teaching Students with Reading Difficulties Grades K to Six. Uh, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner and I have the honor of serving as Patton State Lead for Literacy. And joining from the Patent Literacy team this evening is our regional Western lead, Jeannie Hertzler. She's gonna to wave to you. And then from our Patent East office, uh, Amanda Sapola and Sherry Hartman. <laughs> Tonight, our focus will be chapter five, Structured Literacy Interventions for Reading Fluency. Leading our learning will be chapter co-authors, Roxanne Hudson, Aaron Anderson, Melissa McGraw, Rebecca Ray, and Allison Wilhelm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have placed in the chat the link to the book study um, on the Patent Literacy Resource Hub. Here you will find the book study schedule, information about the book, and a Padlet with all the recordings and resources related to this book study. Um, also, we would like you to check out the Patent Literacy Resource Hub where you will find lots of resources and we'll be putting that link in the chat as well. Um, please paste questions in the chat for these uh, wonderful presenters. The questions just come to the host, so I'll be monitoring those. Um, at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll take a few minutes to um, answer those questions from the presenters. And now I'm going to turn this over to Sherry Hartman, who will introduce our presenters for this evening. Thanks, Pam. It's my honor to present the following team that co-authored Chapter 5. Roxanne Hudson is a professor of special education at the University of Washington. Her research and teaching focuses on early reading development and interventions effective for a wide range of readers. Her co-authors are all doctoral students at the University of Washington. Erin Anderson focuses on early childhood emergency literacy skills and the roles of caregivers in supporting young children's literacy skill development. Melissa McGraw and Rebecca Ray are both focused on supporting multilingual students with disabilities in literacy instruction. Allison Wilhelm is committed to pursuing inclusive, rigorous, and research-based education for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, especially in the areas of early literacy and language. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roxanne. I'm excited to hear from you ladies tonight. Thank you all so very much for joining us this afternoon or this evening as we discuss chapter five of the Structured Literacy Interventions book, which focuses on interventions for reading fluency. We are thrilled to have you join us today. Um, our chapter contained quite a lot of content on reading fluency, and yet we only have an hour to discuss it. So we're gonna be highlighting um, selected aspects of our chapter to focus on today. To center your thinking, we'd like you to think about these guiding questions that we'll be focusing on throughout our presentation. How do the elements of accuracy, automaticity, and prosody support children's reading fluency skills? What role does text selection play in reading fluency instruction? What information should you consider when using oral reading fluency or ORF assessments? Why should you not use round robin reading? and timed repeated readings can support which elements of reading fluency. We'd like to um, take a moment to activate your prior knowledge and see what your thoughts are around what is reading fluency. We'd like you to try this brief true or false quiz. To access it, you can take a screenshot of the QR code on your screen or click on the link in the chat box to access.
So looking at the results so far of our Google quiz, it appears as though many of you agree um, that the key elements of reading fluency include accurately reading at a conversational rate with appropriate prosody. Uh, reading fluency is not speed reading. We are not trying to encourage students to read as fast as they can or participate in speed reading drills, as this isn't the point of reading fluency and ultimately doesn't aid in their comprehension. Additionally, it is not encouraging students to guess or skip unfamiliar or more challenging words. We'd like to briefly unpack these three elements to give you context for the rest of our discussion. So when we're talking about accuracy, we're talking about a student's ability to recognize and decode words correctly. And in order to do this, a fluent reader must be able to understand the alphabetic principle, know a large number of high frequency words, and also be able to blend sounds together to read words. Automaticity is a student's ability to read a large number of words automatically with little effort. And prosody is when a student's able to read like their speaking voice, and it includes the components of intonation, stress patterns, and um, rhythm when reading a text. Now, Rebecca is going to talk to us about the role of text in reading fluency. Yeah, thanks. So let's now anchor our conversation in the important role of text in developing reading fluency. So on the upcoming two slides, you will have the opportunity to practice and reflect on your own reading fluency with two different reading passages, A and B. When the slide appears, we will allow about 20, 25 seconds for you to practice. You may choose to read out loud or silently. And note that in the interest of time, we fully don't expect you will be able to complete the entirety of the reading. Um, and that I will abruptly cut you off to move on. Um, this is just designed to give you a little practice. So let's move to our first sample. Okay, you may begin now. Okay, you may have noticed that this passage is a paragraph taken from our chapter that we're here discussing today. Let's move on to B. This passage is an excerpt from Intelligent Explorations of the String Theory Landscape. And so you may begin this passage. Okay, some of you are probably just waiting to be cut off. <laughs> um, I will now ask some questions to help guide your independent reflection of this experience. Um, how was that for you? What did you notice about your own fluency across the two passages? Where did you feel more fluent, less fluent, and why do you think that might be? I'm seeing a lot of I'm seeing a lot of passage A, <laughs> the first passage. The way you engaged with both of those passages and how fluently you rated yourself was largely influenced by a combination of the text and what you were bringing to the text. Um, I suspect, and I'm seeing in the chat, that many of you identified feeling more fluent on passage A. So let's consider some of the reasons why that may be the case. There is some variation in how this idea of text complexity is conceptualized. Some define this on simply being a matter of the number of multisyllabic words or the number of words in a sentence. And others who we are drawing upon here 
view text complexity as an interaction between the text itself and also reader characteristics, including things like cultural background, languages, how the reader engages with challenging tasks, and thinking about interest and motivation for reading. And so some other factors that to consider are text genre. The difference in understanding types of structure across narrative and expository texts may influence your fluency. And in general, we may notice that we slow down when we are reading to gather information about something, especially new information, which we may have felt in uh, text B. <laughs> um, vocabulary also matters. Words that appear within a reader's spoken vocabulary will likely increase fluency. Syntax um, and multisyllabic words will also affect fluency. Longer complex sentences with more multisyllabic words will likely slow down or impact um, fluency. The type of language present in a text, so for example, is there figurative language such as idiomatic expressions, metaphors, similes, and if that is language that is not familiar or known in your spoken vocabulary, it's likely to affect your reading fluency. And also just thinking about different languages that the reader may speak and how the text does or does not reflect their spoken language, dialect, for example, um, or different languages that they speak. And then finally, content, including background knowledge. How much you know about a topic you are reading about, how interested you are in this topic, how motivated you are, why you're reading it, this will all affect your reading fluency. So these are important considerations to keep in mind as we think about implications for assigning labels to students as fluent readers or not, especially as we think about the types of texts that we may be asking young people to read that may be a mismatch for their own characteristics, which Melissa will say a little bit more about on the next slide. Thank you. So, in addition to thinking about text complexity, there are a few other things we can keep in mind as we are assessing our students reading fluency. So on the left of the slide here, there are some general guidelines for fluency. So initially, we want to start with measuring fluency based on reading letter sounds. And we'd be looking for students to be able to read 60 correct sounds per minute. And then we can focus on measuring fluency either at the word level or by asking our students to read connected text. And so this will just depend on where our students are at in their reading development. And you can see the guidelines here based on grade level for uh, measuring fluency. And this is generally where we'd like to see students for each grade level, but we can also keep in mind that based on what we know about our students, we might wanna be a little bit more flexible rather than following this as sort of a rigid criteria. So some things that we might keep in mind related to our students include their linguistic and cultural background. So if we think about our students' linguistic and cultural identities, how might that influence the, the passage they're reading and their fluency? If a student is reading a text that is focused on a topic that is very similar to their personal experiences that is likely to aid in their fluency versus if they're reading something that's quite unfamiliar, they are likely to read at a slower rate. And that's something that you all just had an opportunity to experience most likely. We can also think about our child's vocabulary. And Rebecca spoke to this a little bit in that if children are reading familiar vocabulary words, that's going to support their fluency. If they're encountering words that are unfamiliar, or perhaps a word that is in their verbal lexicon, but maybe it's their first time encountering that word in print that could also impact their fluency. We can also consider the child's natural speech. So children are going to speak in different ways and we would expect their reading to be similar to how they speak if they are reading fluently. And so this brings to mind a student that I worked with who was a very accurate reader. He had excellent comprehension, but he 
just read very slowly and his typical speech when you had a conversation with him he wasn't rushed he just sort of took his time putting his thoughts together and so his reading was similar and so although he wasn't at he wasn't in line with these guidelines we see on the screen um, he was still reading in a similar way to his speech and then finally, we can consider our children's background knowledge related to the topic. So this is kind of similar to language and culture, but we can also think about students' interests. So for example, if we think about a text about maybe something like dinosaurs, where there can be a lot of really complicated words to decode, if a child knows a lot about dinosaurs, they might be able to access that text versus a child who doesn't have very much knowledge and familiarity with the vocabulary would be slowed down. And so thinking about what our children know related to the topic of the passage is really helpful and as we interpret their overall fluency. So next we will look at some different fluency interventions and Roxanne is going to share some resources with you. So well, I'm just going to quickly jump in um, and ask you to think about a time when you were younger in which you probably had a teacher randomly call on you to read aloud in front of your classmates and think about the emotions that you felt during that experience when you were asked to read aloud in front of your peers. Um, who would want you here would want to have read passage B aloud to any of their peers? Definitely not me. Um, so round robin reading, which is also called popcorn reading, popsicle reading, and combat reading, often involves a teacher randomly calling on a student to read aloud in front of their class, and it is very problematic. Research has shown that it teaches students very little. It's often really embarrassing. Um, it's not engaging at all. It really has little connection to real life, and importantly, it really reduces the amount of time that could be better spent on more valuable reading practice. So please, please, please do not include Ron Robin in your reading fluency instruction. We'd also just like to um, add for accuracy interventions. Um, that chapters two and three on phonemic awareness and um, uh, reading long words provide excellent ideas for interventions um, related to accuracy and we encourage you to check those chapters out if you haven't already and now roxanne will talk about automaticity instruction hi glad to be here it's exciting to be here i am looking for my slide so the most common and well-researched method for improving reading fluency is repeated reading. When readers practice a text more than once, they build stronger lexical representations of the words, developing them into sight words and improving their speed of access. Repeated reading has been researched for quite a long time, and there's a pretty good body of research about it that we can look at to see what the most effective ways to do repeated reading are. One early finding from Joe Torgerson and Carol Rochotte is that the more words overlap between texts, the larger the amount of transfer between texts. So having students read in themes where they're encountering similar vocabulary over multiple texts, ensuring that texts have um, a lot of high frequency words that repeat across texts will give kids a chance to interact in and learn and practice um, the same words over and over again and that will improve their fluency and their opportunities to build those really strong lexical representations as well there's been several different meta-analyses that have been done on repeated readings and one of them found that when students read to an adult it's a much larger effect on reading rate and accuracy than when kids read passages to a peer and one of the biggest reasons for that is that adults support, we teach, we provide feedback, we model, we correct. We do a lot more action and activity during these sessions than a peer might be able to do. It's also much more powerful if students read until they reach a rate and accuracy criterion rather than a set number of times. And these ESs here are effect sizes. So an effect size of 1.7 is a really huge effect size. If I got a 1.7 on one of my studies, I would do cartwheels down the hall, buy you all a beer, it would be very exciting. And so to think about a, a, a method of building fluency that has a, such a large effect size is really exciting. 
And when I say that it, it is reading a rate and accuracy criterion, what I mean by that is you read the passage as many times as it takes to get to 40 correct words per minute or 90 or whatever the goal is, rather than having students read it two or three times. Finally, Morgan and Sedaris did an, a meta-analysis primarily looking at single case design research. And they found that goal setting and feedback were the most effective elements in increasing reading rate and accuracy amongst readers with and without disabilities. So I'm gonna share with you um, a method of developing onomaticity that involves reading to an adult with direct corrective feedback until students read a, a rate and accuracy criterion and has uh, elements of goal setting in, integrated into it. It's called timed repeated readings. And it is something that I did a great deal as a special education teacher and also in my research. It was a very powerful, purposeful, focused way of practicing reading that was really effective for um, a lot of different kinds of students. So when you're doing timed repeated readings, you can build automaticity at multiple levels. You can go through the same steps if you're having students practice isolated letter sounds, decodable words with those sounds, high frequency words in isolation, or my favorite is in phrases. You can also have students build automaticity in decodable connected text or connected text at higher levels of difficulty. And I tend to like to arrange them by lexile level so that the difficulty gets um, higher in little increments. But all of these are something that you can do using timed repeated readings. If you decide that your student really needs to have um, practice with isolated letter sounds, it's really important to make sure that they also work in words or connected text so that they get a chance to practice using those sounds to do what we actually care that they can do, which is decode and read. Um, when we just work in isolation, it's not always clear to students how to use those isolated sounds. So having them practice in words and text is pretty important. This is an example of um, someone from our chapter, Celia, um, is an accurate, excited, motivated reader who's also quite slow. Her um, letter sound fluency is 40 correct sounds per minute. So she is somebody who needs to work on isolated letter sounds. This is a page from a series of letter sound timings that you actually have, have available, the URLs down at the bottom. They're individual pages that um, start quite low, 30 correct sounds per minute and add um, difficulty until you hit 60. So Celia here, our example is on sounds practice 11. So she's been doing it for a while. And you can see she's mostly working on digraphs at this point. So there are student materials that they would see, and then there are teacher materials. She's also working on decodable words with the, the patterns that she's practiced. Um, you can see that you also have a, these materials available to you as well. This particular word practice sheet, you notice that smiley face there. Teachers, you can decide what um, fluency level or automaticity level is most appropriate for your student whenever you're doing anything in these materials. So it may be that for your reader, 55, which is where I have that smiley face, is much more appropriate than 80. And so you can adjust how fluent or how automatic you're trying, the goals that you're trying to reach, regardless of what the materials are telling you based on your knowledge of your, your reader and the goals of, of where they're at. As well, you can do fluency building in lots of different kinds of texts. You can use decodable texts. I know that many people have access to lots of different kinds of those. Really, anything short and interesting to your students that they can read with 95% accuracy is what, your, um, is what you can use. So text that reflects your students' identities that they connect to, that fits their backgrounds, that's interesting to them. Um, often with timed repeated readings, we're using it with reluctant readers readers who haven't had a lot of success, readers who aren't very interested in reading very much. And so thinking really hard about making the text something that's engaging and interesting to them that they're going to want to read more than once is pretty important. 
it's kind of hard sometimes to build fluency in books. So one thing you can do is make your own timing pages at Intervention Central. They have this great tool. And when you unfortunately type or cut and paste either one text into their tool, it will result in PDFs. And this is the um, student version of Stars and Sparks on stage. I, I typed in the first part of that book. It's a Lexile level 760, so it's um, pretty high up, but it's definitely something that students can read. And I tell you the best part of this tool is the teacher version because it gives you the, it counts the numbers of words for you. If you have ever had to count words and write them down so that you had it to go, you know that this tool is really amazing. So this is something that I use quite a lot when I'm developing timings because I can then choose my text really carefully to have kids work in it. Because you're not going to have students reading 330 correct words per minute, you're going to decide where the appropriate automaticity goal is, put your smiley face, and probably someone would read this in two or three chunks rather than trying to do the whole thing. So it may be that you're doing fluency building in a, in this case, a chapter book across multiple um, sessions. So timed repeated readings has eight steps. The nice thing about them is they repeat each and every single time. So they're pretty easy to learn. It sounds kind of complex at first, but they're, they're pretty easy once you, you try them. Also, our chapter has quite a bit of detail, um, much more detail than I can share with you tonight. So you can refer back to it when you wanna try and practice. So while it looks like in uh, assessment, timed repeated readings is, a, is teaching, we are instructing students. So the first thing that you do is you preview the material with them. They practice the timing page that they're about to do. And the instructor provides whatever help the student needs. If you're modeling the new sounds or new letter patterns that they're working on, any error correction, it might be that you're just listening out of the corner of your ear and ready to help if they need it. But whatever help they need, that is what you provide. The second step is that re you review the graph with the student. Timed repeated readings uses a graph for measuring progress and providing motivation. It's really critical to use the graph every time with the students. Um, it's one of the, in my experience, one of the few times kids who have struggled can see their own improvement. It's often the first time that they can see how much better that they're doing. And so the graph becomes really important. So after the student has practiced their page, you look at the graph together and you look at their last timing right here and you say, oh, last time you did 56 and one mistake, that was fabulous. Look at our goal is 60. What do you think you can do today? So the student might say, I'm going to try and read more words. I'm going to make fewer mistakes, although with one mistake, that's probably not a particular good goal. I'm going to try and read faster. But having them be intentional about what they're trying to do during that session is pretty important. So after you've practiced, set your goal with the student, then they read. And so they read as many sounds or words as possible in one minute and you time them on a countdown timer so you're sure that you have a minute there. And I um, tend to count errors behind my back because I can remember what the words are. Um, otherwise, you can mark the correct the errors that students make on your copy and then where they end. Um, if your student bogs down and they lose fluency and it's not something that uh, it's something that's interrupting them, then you can just give the correct pronunciation of the word or the sound, mark it wrong and have them keep going. We really don't want to interrupt the fluency that's being built or the automaticity that's being built. So if you have to, you can just give the correct response. So after they read, you give constructive feedback. Um, and the first thing that you do is positive. So for Celia, I might say, wow, I'm really impressed with how you sounded this word out. That had to blend at the beginning. You had to remember that, that silent E at the end. That was really great. Can you read that for me again? Prose. Excellent. That was really, really impressive. 
Um, you might then say, well, I also noticed that you um, had a trouble with this word right here. The AR is going to say R, B, R, what's that word, bar? And then you can have them practice this word, this word, this word. You can tell this is the new um, pattern that they're learning on this page. You can ask them to read this word and they're practicing the AR pattern in each one of those words. So error correction can be you helping them to code. It could be you um, giving them opportunities to practice throughout the page. But whatever you're gonna do, it's, it's good, solid, explicit error correction. After you do that, you um, calculate the score. Often students can do this themselves once you teach them how, but you find out where they ended, um, how many sounds or words they read, you count the number of errors they made, and that's your correct score. Um, for an error for us, we tend to count a wrong word or a wrong sound as an error. If they skip a word, that's an error. Um, I don't typically count repeated words as an error because especially with beginning readers, that's often them repeating the sentence and they're regaining their fluency. And that's actually a strategy I really want them to use. So over time, that's not good. That's part of why they're um, needing to build automaticity. But at first, as they're using that strategy, I, I would not count that as an error. I would count insertions if they're adding extra words as an error. And then if there's a proper name in the passage, they're often less decodable than the rest of the, the passages. So I count it only once if they keep making that same mistake. Um, and then we work on that name. So that is the score that you'll graph. And then you graph it. And I have found, and others I know have found, that if you teach students how to graph it themselves, they, they can learn that. You're going to use this graph with students provide um, really important information about progress and motivation. You're going to write down data here, and then you're going to skip over here and put it in. So that's a lot of information on a graph. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of it. This is also available on that same website. We have a graph that goes to 100 for younger readers and 150 for older readers. So first, um, there's eight weeks of data on here and you put the Monday date for each week so you know when you did it. Um, there, each graph can be used for either letter sounds or words or text. When I was a special education teacher, my students pretty much all had all three. They did their letter sounds, they did words with those sounds and text with those words. The goal that you're trying to reach, um, it is in, in letter sounds, correct sounds per minute. It's, it's one a second, it's fast enough. I always allow students to have a, an error or two. I figured that my life, I'm not usually 100% accurate, and so I'm not gonna ask them to be either. You can decide for yourself if you want one error or two errors. These yellow lines indicate a new page. So every time students meet their page um, goal, we draw a yellow line so we can remind ourselves what the data are for. And also over here, you can do it if it's easier to keep track of things. I don't always, but it, it does kind of help you keep track of your scores. The page number you can put here, you don't have to, but again, often you're doing fluency building with lots of different students. You have a binder. It's often helpful to have the, as much information on the graph as you can so you can keep track of what you're doing. The correct, in this case, sounds per minute goes above the line and the number of errors goes below. So one of the things that's really important about timed repeated readings is that we stair step our individual goals. So young Celia started out at 40 correct sounds per minute. It's pretty unreasonable to expect her to go from 40 to 60 in one page. That's just not a very reasonable thing. And so she has stair-stepping goals. So the first one was 40, then 45, then 50, 55, and then we're going to stick with 60. This does take a little bit of practice. It does take a little bit of time, but it's definitely well worth it. 
and um, will give you lots of good information for students. We're on step seven, we're almost done. Um, you decide, did the student make their goal? Woohoo! Um, it's based on both rate and accuracy. So for example, this student made, um, let's see, 63 and two mistakes. If that student had made 63 with four mistakes, they would not have made their goal. They have to meet both the accuracy, the rate and the accuracy. And in my experience, it's often the accuracy that gets a lot of attention, at least at first. A lot of students are not used to needing to be really accurate and pay really close attention. So sometimes our initial goals are to slow down and be more accurate, um, that they're going way too fast and they're not attending to what they're doing. The other thing about these goals is that we make the decision of whether they made their goal just on the data. I think one of the most powerful things about timed repeated readings is the curriculum does not slow students down. It goes as fast as they can. So if they reach their goal, they move on. Partly it's because the materials repeat a lot and they're gonna see the same letter sounds and words. Um, and if you're thinking about text across themes um, text, but also partly you really want them to move as quickly as they can and build automaticity as fast as they can. If they make their goal, they move on to a new page. Woohoo! And you celebrate. That's a step eight. We're using um, a graph for motivation, but we are also talking about students who have not been successful in reading, who may or may not enjoy reading, who may be reluctant to read. And so it's also, especially at first, helpful to put into place some sort of motivation. It might be lunch with the teacher, um, something else that's meaningful to your students. I found the banana split worked really well with my elementary students. Um, I learned it from another teacher and was really grateful to her for sharing. Each time they made a goal, they got to add a piece to their banana split. So they glued on the bowl, they glued on the strawberry ice cream, the chocolate ice cream. Mm. And when the whole thing was finished for my whole class, I brought in ice cream and we shared it. But I got two and a half months of motivation out of construction paper and glue. It was very exciting. Um, and the kids were really happy and it made them, it made them want to do the, the hard work of building automaticity. I then tried to use uh, it with pizza and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work and they really didn't care if they earned a piece or not was that the graphs had become really motivating and they didn't need that external motivation. So you may plan on phasing it out as they become more successful, they see their own progress and they become more, more automatic and competent readers that you don't need that outside motivation. If the student doesn't meet the goal, then we provide support to them. So they're going to read the page the next day. Um, it feels kind of bad about it, but you know, it's just, a, it's just what happens. And when you're providing support, please try not to attribute failure to the task being hard. Don't say, oh, that's okay, that was a hard page. We want students to do hard things. We want them to believe that they can do hard things. And so instead, we should encourage students to keep practicing, to keep focusing, provide additional practice for them, give them extra support, or otherwise motivate them to help working on that goal um, because we want them to feel like they can do really difficult things. Whew. That was a lot about timed repeated readings. There are eight steps. It's a really powerful way to do, um, to do automaticity building. And now Allie is gonna talk with you about prosody. Roxanne um, and Pam also just let me know that we have a bunch of questions from you all. So we will definitely save some time for that in the end, but we're gonna spend a little bit of time also thinking about prosody. Um, I'm sure you guys are all asking that. So. Prosody connects that fluent word reading that we talked about to building comprehension of those texts over time. So kind of from a linguistics jargony perspective, these are the supersegmental patterns in words, specifically thinking about intonation, stress, and rhythm. So differences in these qualities um, influence our understanding of speech. Patterns in word stress really shift our understanding of what we interpret. For example, that's not my cup of coffee. 
that's not my cup of coffee, the stress emphasizes different elements of that structured sentence. And you might interpret an underlying meaning differently based on that. So disfluency becomes connected to prosody when we think about the difficulties in varying expression and phrasing to match those texts. So think back to when you were in high school and someone handed you your first Shakespearean text. Someone said the words iambic pentameter to you and you said, huh, what? <laughs> so remember that, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. How did you experience reading that? Was it easy at first? Was it confusing? Was it hard? Reflecting on those feelings, let's think about Josh's dis disfluency with modern English texts. We described his oral reading in the chapter as choppy with mispunctuation and uneven phrasing. So despite being an accurate reader and working on improving his rate, it's necessary that Josh learn to chunk phrases into meaningful units for understanding. This will help him match the meaning of the text, especially as those texts become more challenging over time. So now we're gonna think about one of the interventions that we mentioned in our chapter, which is phrase cued texts. Although there are other options for teaching prosody, phrase cued texts lend themselves nicely to understanding the impact of direct instruction, data collection, and progress monitoring on student growth. So along the left side of our slide, you will see our abbreviated five-step model for using those phrase cued texts. When you're thinking about these strategies, you also wanna make sure that you're choosing high interest or rhythmic texts, again, at that 95% accuracy level. This could be something like The Cat in the Hat or Brown Bear, Brown Bear with younger readers that give them that support and the opportunity to model that phrasing. You also wanna teach when you um, and model prosody when you're reading aloud. Teachers are great at this, right? We do this all the time. So you can also use this to think aloud what the purpose of reading with expression could be. Um, again, providing many opportunities to practice across settings using different genres, nonfiction, fiction, and then different styles of practice. This could be reader's theater or a role-playing game. We've included this visual legend as something you can use when you're instructing about prosody. What cues do I look for? What does that cue mean in a text? Go to the next slide for me. Great. Thank you. So this is just an example. Um, that we provided as how you might cue that text. So um, I wanna make sure that we have time for everyone's questions. So just to look at this quickly, some things you might wanna consider here are, what is this sequence of target skills that I want to um, prioritize when I'm working with this? So on this sample, the highlighting is only on the ending punctuation and then on the short phrases within phrases. So we wanna prioritize punctuation intervention for Josh. That's where he really needed to think about stopping and focusing. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, you might try something that's a role-playing activity with a text like this. Could Josh read a selection from one of Dr. King's speeches? We didn't cover reader's theater again in this chapter, but this could also be a different resource that he could practice with as well. Overall, keep in mind, regardless of the text or approach that you choose, you should continue to purposely track that data. Prosody is more subjective in nature than we described um, earlier in this presentation. So you want to track those errors and assess systematically about that progress over time. Um, on the right lower corner, you can see our example of an informal assessment rubric that you might use to rate students' prosody. This rubric has a qualitative rating scale, as well as a rough guide for um, counting and observing errors. Students can set goals and use this chart in the same way that they would with those time repeated readings piece. Um, so for our last slide here, I wanna thank you for sticking with us. We've covered a lot of information with you today. We wanted to spiral review through some of those key takeaways from our chapter and the discussion that we've had. So when you are approaching structured literacy intervention for students with disfluency, you'll wanna consider one, the applied definitions of fluency that we talked about today, those principles for systematic assessment and instruction, and also steps for generalizing fluency skills to further applications in literacy, like comprehension of complex texts. The key here is that you know that accuracy, automaticity, and prosody are the key elements of fluent reading. Fluent readers are able to effortlessly vary their expression and phrasing in ways that mimic oral speech. Fluent reading maps onto our ability to comprehend those written texts. All right, go ahead.
head to that next slide for me, Roxanne. Thank you all so much. We appreciate greatly your willingness to take time out of your day and time away from your work and your families to participate in this collective book study with us. Um, we are ready for your questions. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. It's such a thorough and wonderful presentation. And there were many questions coming through, so we'll see how many we can get to. And then perhaps if we can't get to them all, uh, we could send them to you and you could um, you know, send out back uh, questions, uh, answers to those questions. Yeah, but I see Roxanne nodding her head, so good. All right, so questions, here we go. Uh, first question was from Karen F. On page 101 in paragraph two, it states, found that goal setting and feedback were more effective than previewing, listening, and repeated reading. I thought when doing assessment, passages should be unfamiliar. And so, and Karen F, if I not captured that correctly, please uh, unmute, but that's what I have in the chat. Can you ask the question again? I'm sorry. It says on page 101 in paragraph two, it states, and then there's quotations, found that goal setting and feedback were more effective than previewing, listening, and repeated reading. I thought when doing assess assessment, passages should be unfamiliar. And Karen, ah, now I understand. Mm -hmm. They're talking about instruction. So one of the things that's a little confusing about automaticity building is there's a timer involved and you're graphing data and you're counting errors and all that. But when you're teaching, goal setting and feedback is really important. And in their uh, meta-analysis found that it was more effective than previewing, although I think you need to preview anyway. But when you're assessing, of course, you want to um, use a cold passage if that's something that you're doing or give chance, kids a chance to scan it because it's more closer to how we actually read. But in timed repeated readings, you want to make sure that, that you're teaching. Okay, thank you. Next up um, from Jen. I know time fluency practice can be helpful, but as a parent practicing at home, is there a benefit? Students are setting goals and can get very upset when they don't meet those goals. Is it worth the anxiety to time at home? It depends on your reader. If they're already a, a automatic reader, then no. Uh, the, the, you can take all the joy out of reading by doing this with a, with a really good skilled reader. Um, it's not for them. If they're a slow, accurate reader, it is worth doing. And you want to be very careful about your goal setting. So you want to start where they are and then stair step gradually up to a more automatic level. So the anxiety that you're getting might be because your goals are a little too high. And then I also um, worked really hard. I also worked really hard to turn it into a competition with themselves as opposed to anything else. And so we were on the team together. We were working together. We were going to be successful together as opposed to a right or wrong kind of thing that you could fail. So it was definitely partly how your goals are set and partly how you sort of frame what you're doing. Thank you. Can I add to that, Roxanne, too? I would share um, just the difference between working in school and home. I know it can be really pronounced, but home is a great place to really focus on those highly motivating texts. And even if it's a little more challenging, um, you know, you can support them throughout it and then just choose a small selection of a highly motivating book or chapter to focus on. And maybe you just do that at the beginning and then the rest is fun and free, or maybe your child responds better to the opposite and you read together. And then that last minute is just a quick practice time read. Thank you, Allison. Um, there was a question about whether the um, norms, the ORF norms were from Hasbrook and Tyndall. They are, they are. Um, it's right around the 50th percentile. They are right around there. Lots of the CBM measures have benchmarks and, and, and um, you know, red and green and yellow and all. And we just wanted to give a general idea of what you might expect a, an automatic reader to be able to do at those grade levels. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about uh, when students are doing repeated readings, how do we know they're not memorizing? Well, part of building automaticity is memorizing. So um, that's actually not a bad thing. Um, we want to make sure that we get students' um, words into 
their memory so that they're sight words, that they can read them by sight. And so when you're building automaticity, um, you're going to keep doing that. If you mean, how do we know that they're not memorizing the visual patterns? Well, these timed repeated readings that I'm talking about are really focused on phonics patterns and teaching individual letter sounds and how to decode those into words. And so I think a lot of it is how you're instructing and how that initial practice is happening. And again, this is something that you want to do with someone who's already accurate, but is slow. And so if they're still learning letter sounds and not ready to apply them in automaticity building, then you wanna do that accuracy building first before you start moving into automaticity. But in the end, you really are trying to get them solidly in their, in their memory as a sight word. Thank you. Um, next question. Are there benefits to engaging in repeated reading with reading decodable text over grade level passages? It depends on your reader. I hate that answer, but it's true. It's absolutely completely true. Um, if your readers are still acquiring the, the different syllable patterns and are still acquiring the, the phonics patterns, then you need to really be in decodable text for them because that's gonna give them the autom automaticity building that they need. But if they're past that and they're reading multisyllabic words and they're reading more complicated text, then, then you might be closer to grade level text. But if you have someone who's really skilled and is ready to read grade level text, this isn't the appropriate thing for them. It's really just for disfluent kids. I will say that if you have, say, a fourth grader who's um, able to read second grade material at about 80 correct words per minute, you do not want to have them reading grade level text. They're not ready for that yet. Um, you want to have them in text that they're about 95% accurate in. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what is your response to timed repeated readings being compared to mad minute drills and mathematics? and how the timed measure puts undue pressure on kids to perform. I don't know mad minutes, so I don't have a good um, response to that. I will say that it's all in how you frame it. So when I do this kind of work with kids, I don't say, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Here's my timer, we're gonna go, 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 go. I don't do that. Uh, we practice. We get ready. I say, when you're ready, you can start. They start reading. I click a timer under the table. So I turn it into something that's much more relaxed and, and not frantic like that because we're trying to build automaticity in reading. And we just started out talking about how fluent reading is accurate reading at a conversational rate with good prosody. And that kind of excitement is really not gonna do that for you. So I have worked really hard over the years to keep it pretty mellow, low stress. And again, it's a lot of it is in your goal setting and making those goals appropriately challenging, but not too hard. And the next question was, if you had any recommend recommendations for decodable text. I knew that was gonna be a question. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. 383 people on the call who could provide really good examples of decodable text. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that I really like the primary phonics readers. I really like them. Um, not the workbooks, not the comprehension things, but the phonics decodables I personally really like. There's lots and lots of them out there that have much better illustrations, much better um, storylines. Um, I know if you go on Facebook and you look at the science of reading um, group there, there's 50,000 lists of good decodable text that you can find. Okay, it came and you did a great job answering it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> uh, next up. Um, the new IES intervention guide recommends that the repeated readings should have a specific purpose such as expression, answering questions, et cetera. What do you recommend? I haven't looked at that, so I don't have a good answer. If you're doing repeated readings where you're reading it, say, two times or three times or four times, you would want to read each time for a particular purpose. You would want to answer a question, ask, a, um, analyze a character, notice the setting. 
if you're doing timed repeated readings, your focus is on rate and accuracy, and that's your purpose. So I'm not sure what kind of repeated readings they're thinking about. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, does a student's first read need to be a cold read, or can an adult read aloud the passage modeling appropriate prosody? The practice is whatever they need. So if they need you to read it aloud with good prosody, absolutely. Having a model is a really good thing. Um, if they need you to, to help them sound out words or practice words, then you should do that. But you definitely don't want to do a cold read. Um, we're trying to teach and we want to ensure that when they do their one minute timing, that they are ready to go, they're accurate, they're solid, they're, they're feeling good. All right, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, question about the round robin reading. How do I get a feel for their understanding of decoding and reading level if I don't get to read uh, with them individually? Uh, learning support teacher here. Well, we have lots of, um, all my co-authors can answer this one if they feel like it. I don't know if anyone feels like it. Um, I wanna make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. So you're saying that that's the only time the support teacher gets to interface with the students that they work with? Um, the question came from Abby, if she would like to unmute. Sure. I'm sorry, um, I can only um, yep. share. Sure, that's okay. I think I would just, um, again, not totally understanding that context of things, I would say that um, I think our definition of round robin is a little bit more putting students on the spot. So you could do a lot in one-to-one -one conferencing, quick readings, um, you know, even dropping in during solo reading. Hey, can you read that page out loud to me? I wanna hear how you're doing or during small group activities. So there are different ways to structure your classroom and your content to um, have those opportunities to see how students are doing without putting everyone center stage and on the spot. Yes, thank you. Um, would you mind your gracious presenters and such skilled presenters if we sent the, the remaining questions to you and we could answer them uh, in a Word doc and then we would put it on the pad that we would greatly appreciate that. That way everyone's question gets answered. I think we're about five or six left, uh, but we are approaching the eight o'clock hour. Would that be all right? That would be great. We would I did put you on the spot a little bit there, but thank you. <laughs> We'd be honored to do that. Thank you so much. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Amanda Sapola, who is going to share the information about the form that you need to complete, as well as the author for the next week's chapter. Thank you, Pam. So thank you for joining us for this evening's book study session. We're grateful to Roxanne Hudson, Erin Anderson, Melissa McGraw, Rebecca Ray, and Allison Wilhelm for deepening our knowledge of Chapter 5, Structured Literacy Interventions for Reading Fluency. The recording for this presentation will be added to the Patent Literacy Resource Hub, and it could also be found at the link that was shared in the chat, as well as it will be available on the Patent YouTube channel.